Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Rostrum. The Language and Thinking program hosts each year this series of lectures and events. My name is Thomas Barcher, it hasn't changed over the weekend. And I uh, first want to congratulate you all on finishing your first uh, week at Bard College. Congratulations. What this, what this means for you is that now the real business begins. If, if, you are, if you've been fully engaged in the program thus far, which as I gather from most of the faculty, most of you have been, now's the opportunity to really decide what you want to get done. You, you know the basic routine now, you know, how, you know about uh, the procedures, the techniques, the way we're approaching texts. What can you do as a writer? What can you do as a thinker? What, what, how are you going to make the most of this last full week of language and thinking, three days on the following week? So this is the last full week. What are you going to do with this time? And also I want particularly to encourage you to think about working with your uh, with the group, because you won't be together forever, in fact, you won't be together for much longer, I'm sorry to say. So make, make use of the community that you've established. And if you're the one or two people or three who haven't engaged yet, stop wasting time. Get down. Now is the time to get down to, get down to business. So um, I... I don't want to introduce uh, our speaker today, actually. Um, I'm really resisting uh, this introduction. It, you see, the thing that an introduction is supposed to do is uh, basically to tell you why you're here, why you have the person uh, speaking, talking about what he's talking about. And in part, that has to do with putting it in the context of what you're, of what you're doing, in the context of the program. And in part, it's telling you about the speaker. And it's the second thing I don't want to do context of the program, it makes you know, a lot of sense. This is uh, the uh, talk is about, in part, about Hannah Arendt, who is in your anthology. And you may know that Hannah Arendt is also in the ground here at Bard College. She's buried on campus. You can go visit her cemetery, write a poem there to her love poem. Uh, she is also uh, her husband, one of her, I think, her only husband second husband, uh, taught at Bard College and was actually the founder of what became the first year seminar program. Her literary estate, her literary remains are in part at Bard College. You can go to the library here and see the books that Hannah Arendt, she was, I'm sure you all know, one of the greatest uh, philosophers, political theorists of the, the 20th century. A lot of her books are here in the library at Bard College. You can see the little marginal notes she makes in the, books, I encourage you to do that. And in fact, uh, she went to, she taught at the University of Chicago at the Committee on Social Thought, which is uh, where I did my graduate work. And also, um, quite a while before me, uh, there was a guy named Leon Botstein who studied at uh, the University of Chicago and studied with Hannah Arendt. So she's sort of a, a um, patron saint of Bard and her, um, and the, there's a center at Bard College now, which is run by our guest today, which is called the Hannah Arendt Center for Politics and the Humanities, uh, recently, um, well, recently, in fact, for several years, has held major conferences at Bard College uh, that I'll tell you about one of them in a moment. So the uh, Hannah Arendt makes sense here. This, her book, her um, essay is in your anthology. It's about the things that are central to the work that you're doing. So that all makes sense. But the guy, the guy is the problem. Because full disclosure, he's a friend of mine, he's the speaker. His name's Roger Berkowitz. And uh, he's a friend of mine. And uh, if I tell you anything about him, it's just going to make you all want to study with him. More people are going to want to study with him. And he already has so many students that, and he dedicates himself so completely to his students that if I tell you anything about him, then you're going to take his time away from me. So uh, I, I really don't want to, but I will tell you just a few things. Um, Roger Berkowitz uh, has been at Bard College since 2005. He is, the, um, he is the director of the Hannah Arendt Center on campus. The Hannah Arendt Center has um, 
as I mentioned, for several years, organized major conferences and the, just get a load of some of these names. Um, Thinking in Dark Times, Hannah Arendt on Ethics and Politics, that was in 2006. The Burden of Our Times, The Intellectual Origins of the Global Financial Crisis, that was 2009, I think it's about time to do a replay of that one. Uh, last year, Human Being in an Inhuman Age, which uh, hosted, among others, uh, the futurist Kurtz, uh, Ray Kurzweil. And uh, the first of these was uh, published as a book, which was co-edited by our guest, Roger Berkowitz, Thinking in Dark Times, Hannah Arendt, uh, Arendt on Ethics and Politics. Roger Berkowitz is also the editor of Revenge and Justice, which is a special issue of Law, Culture, and Humanities. He's the author of The Gift of Science, Leibniz and the Modern, Leibniz and the Modern Legal Tradition. You can buy that on Amazon, The Gift of Science. He studied at Amherst College. He studied at the University of California, Berkeley, where he did both a JD and a PhD. He has great titles for his conferences, also for his articles, History and the Noble Art of Lying, Friedrich Nietzsche, The Code of Manu, and The Art of Legislation. A, a recent article, which I encourage you to read, you can get it online in uh, Democracy, a journal called Democracy, Why We Must Judge. If you write one title down, write that one down, Why We Must Judge, look it up. In the, this autumn, uh, in October, I believe, uh, the Hannah Arendt Center will be hosting a conference. And one of the reasons we have this particular text in the anthology, and one of the reasons why we have uh, Roger Berkowitz speaking today, is because the uh, conference is, uh, you're all welcome to attend the conference. And in fact, uh, Roger has just told me that there's a competition on the website. So if you go to the Hannah Arendt Center website at BAR, you'll find information about the conference. The title of the conference, by the way, is Truth Telling, Democracy in an Age Without Facts. Truth Telling, Democracy in an Age Without Facts. Go to the website for the conference. There's a competition. You can join writing an essay. If you win the competition, you will be, it's a worldwide competition, so you have to you know, really write well. You'll be a panelist at the conference. If you win, you'll be on one of the panels at the conference at Bart. So I encourage you to give this a shot. Look it up. Go to the website, and uh, there's a. It's a. It can be a multimedia online blog. You can ask Roger afterwards for more details about it. I encourage you uh, to look into that and to attempt it, and perhaps even to start now. Start right from this lecture, right afterwards, with your uh, with the humanist essay you write for the language and thinking program. The last thing I'll say um, about Roger is uh, that I really do encourage you, I, I'll give up my time with Roger, I encourage you to seek him out. I've taught, we've taught a class together. He's an extraordinary teacher and an extraordinary thinker and uh, also a dear friend. We're very lucky to have with us Roger Berkowitz. Please welcome him.
that facts are being reduced to opinions and that opinions are masquerading as facts. The problem is that as fact and opinion blur together, the belief and the aspiration for factual truth is being expunged from political argument. For example, how many of you know of the truthers? The truthers hold that 9-11 was a secret plot by Dick Cheney, Donald Rumsfeld, and Paul Wolfowitz to seize oil and gas. They point to many facts that they claim are true, that NORAD was made to stand down so that the planes could reach their destinations, that pre-planted bombs brought the World Trade Center buildings down after impact, that the heat of the explosion could only be generated by a government explosive called theramite. Go on the web, you can find hundreds of websites dedicated to this. Who are these truthers? Well, let me tell you, they're mostly liberal college-educated professionals. Many are engineers and architects. It happens to be where it's centered. Jonathan Kay, who will be speaking at our conference, recently wrote a book called Amongst the Truthers. And some of the things he says is that these truthers in the United States and in Canada and around the world erode our society's collective grasp on reality. There's, they evince a kind of nihilistic distrust of government. Everyone feels entitled to their own private reality. And just so you don't think this is a bunch of just tiny crazy, I mean, we're talking about probably between 15 and 20 percent of the American population, at least according to statistics. Over 30 percent of the American population believes part of this and that the government is hiding something relevant to what the truth is saying. There's a certain way in which what these truthers have created is an internal world, in a sense a mirror image on the other side of the Fox News world, uh, an echo chamber for their own voices, one that is in many ways divorced from uh, the reality that the rest of us live in. When they meet conflicting facts, they assume it's a conspiracy. Thus, all other facts are just opinions to be opposed with the conspiracies and new facts that they bring forward. There is a breakdown, in other words, of a common truth. Another example on the other side, in which we can see the flight in our politics from facts, can be found in the healthcare debate. Mitt Romney, just a couple weeks ago, has continued to repeat the line that healthcare reform act, the healthcare reform act, is a government takeover of healthcare. This claim, which has been making its rounds since 2009 was voted the lie of the year by PolitiFact, a website uh, published in Florida uh, that's dedicated to checking the factual evidence of politicians. I encourage you to take a look at it. It's quite bipartisan. When asked, Romney's campaign responded, quote, it seems pretty obvious that under Obamacare, the federal government takes on a vastly expanded role in health care. He says, whether you call it a takeover or a power grab, the effect is the same. It shifts power and responsibility from the states to Washington. Is it the same to say that the law shifts power and responsibility from the states to Washington and to say that the law is a government takeover? I think the answer is no. Government takeover conjures a European approach or a Canadian approach in which the government owns the hospitals and the doctors or public employees. That's what it's meant to connote. And it's what most people take it to mean. Most Americans now believe that's what the Health Care Act will do. Against this implication, the facts are the following. Employers will continue to provide health insurance to the majority of Americans to private insurance companies. The law does not include the public option, the government-run health care system. No one will be insured by the government. The law requires the purchase of private health care and gives tax credits to enable that purchase. Now, let me say, there is much one can disagree with in this law. It does increase government regulation. It does offer a windfill, windfall to healthcare insurance companies by subsidizing the private purchase of health insurance. It does raise taxes to pay for these subsidies. And it requires everyone to buy health care, which just yesterday was declared unconstitutional by an appellate court in the United States. 
These are all important and controversial points. It would have been good to debate them. Instead, the major points of debate were around the question of government takeover and, of course, the famous example of death panels, both of which were never issued in the law. Okay, so what? We've always had lying in politics. It's not new. It's not going to go away. Um, does this lying, this blurring of fact and opinion, this creating of and defending alternative and opposing realities, does it matter? Isn't that what politics has always been about? But let's stipulate, as Hannah Arendt wrote in the essay that many of you have read called Truth and Politics, that truth and politics are not on the best of terms. Isn't this just par for the course? Aren't what I'm talking about just sound bites not that important? Why should we be concerned? Well, for Hannah Arendt, the loss of truth is an existential question. She thinks that the loss of truth will mean the loss of our political world and more. It's a big claim. She cites, she makes up, in fact, she, she, she paraphrases an old Latin maxim, uh, fiat justitia et periat mundus, let there be justice even if the world must perish, which she says may not be true. She actually opposes that one. But she says it is true to say fiat veritas et periat mundus, let there be truth even if the world perishes. That's the claim she actually wants to defend here. And the argument she wants to make is that to sacrifice truth for the survival of the world, which would seem to make sense, like we'd rather survive than have truth, um, will mean the destruction of the world itself. Without truth, without the ability to say what is, there is no permanence. There is no common world. There is no shared world. The danger is that the world as we know it, that which brings us together, begins to wobble. Take any contested issue today, Israel and Palestine, right? Who's at fault? Tit for tat, tit for tat. Terrorism versus existential threat. Holocaust victims versus expulsion victims. We can go on. Who can say what is in that area? Once you get to that point, once you get to the point of where you can't say what is, when you lose an ability to say what is true, you get to the point of what she calls in the essay, cynicism. The belief that there is no truth, that everything is just spin, image making. And when you get there, you lose the world, the world we share together, the world we live in together and you lose the ground upon which we can form a world together. That is, in a sense, the thesis of her, of her essay, um, and I, I want to talk a little bit more about it. It begins with uh, something I started with and that is central in her essay, which she repeats three or four times in the essay, which is the reduction today, and today is a, a longish term in this world. It begins in the mid-20th century and goes through today. The reduction of facts to opinion. According to Arendt, we are witness to, quote, a large scale clash between factual truth and politics. This is true despite the fact that, quote, no former time tolerated so many diverse opinions on religious and philosophical matters. We have more freedom of opinion today than any time in history. And yet, she says, we have an incredible hostility to facts that oppose our own interests. So one thing you should always ask when you read a bold claim like that is, is she right? Are we hostile to facts that oppose our interests? Well, the example Arendt offers is the fact that in Hitler's Germany and Stalin's Russia, it was dangerous to talk about concentration camps and extermination camps even though their existence was widely known. Everybody knew this was happening. They just didn't talk about it. Even more disturbing, she writes, is the way we tolerate unwelcome factual truths. In order to tolerate them, we consciously or unconsciously turn them into opinion. Right? That's the point she wants to make here. turn them into opinion. 
Think about how we do that in our world today. We have such non-facts in our world today, or now facts qua opinions. Torture, it's a fact. We tortured many people over the last 10 years in response to 9-11. But we still insist in this country that we are an exemplary moral country. We say that it's illegal to torture. We say that it's against the US principles to torture. We all know it, but we deny it. We don't talk about it. Take an example from the headlines this week. Pensions, public employee pensions in this country are simply unsustainable. We cannot pay them. There are very few people who think we will pay them. And no one wants to talk about it. Not seriously. And then there's global warming. As many of you know, there's a debate raging in the United States, around the world, about global warming. Nearly everyone accepts that the Earth's atmosphere is warming. But there is disagreement about whether this is caused by human activity and about how fast it's happening. On one side, you have all these scientists. The number is hard to say, but the vast majority, let's say, probably over 95% of climate scientists, think that humans are causing global warming. And there are a bunch, some very respected, who say, we don't know, or no, it's not happening. And they're joined by a, a wide group of bloggers and others who raise doubts about this. Um, a Gallup poll just taken shows that over the last few years, the share of Americans saying that global warming's effects have already begun has decreased from 61% in 2008 to 49% in March. A huge difference, 12 percent in three, in three, two and a half years. Fewer people think that global warming has begun. Are these people crazy? Are they uneducated? They're actually some of the most educated people in the country. Why is that? Well, they're people who are taught critical thinking in a certain way. They're skeptical of elites. Should they be skeptical? Well, the elites continue to lie to them. So, for example, one of the most quoted examples from the climate scientists of the example of what's going to happen is that the Himalayan glaciers would melt by 2035. This has been a, a, a repeated fact for 10 years in the, in the literature. And it was in the latest IPCC report by the UN. Turns out it's totally wrong. It was based on some, you know, some, some popular you know, example in an Indian magazine years ago that just found its way into the science of literature and no one bothered to check it. It makes the scientists look bad. And then some of you probably know about the East Anglia controversy where the emails, uh, you had a bunch of science, climate scientists uh, who basically refused to reveal their, the sources for their studies. Uh, and uh, finally someone hacked in and found their emails and it turned out a lot of their emails said things like, well, we don't want to talk about this number because you know, it's, it, it, it could be confusing, it could be led to believe that this doesn't happen. Now, most of these have been refuted, and these are just, in a certain sense, the scientific community still exists and says that we are having global warming. But people are skeptical, and there are dissenters. And the result is that only one candidate currently running for president in the Republican Party thinks that we know that global warming is happening and caused by humans. Now, you can write that off and say, oh, Republicans. But one of them is probably going to win. And even so, that's half the country. And you've got to think about what that means. And Arendt's answer is that this is the new normal. The new normal is that people are going to live in different realities. People are going to make up their facts and believe their facts based not on facts, but on their need to believe in a, in a movement or in some idea. Again, so what? Well, one answer is there are policy implications, right? If we don't take action on global warming, there may be policy problems, okay? Important, and I encourage you all to work on that. That's not what I'm here to talk to you about today. The RN Center is very much, and RN herself is dedicated to thinking about real-world problems, not from a policy perspective, although we encourage people to do that, but trying to get to the bottom of them 
in a more philosophical, uh, political, theoretical sense. So what's the political problem? The political problem is, what I've just been saying, is we now live in a world in which facts are opinions and opinions are facts. And what Arendt calls this tendency to transform facts into opinion, to blur the dividing line between them, and here's a quote that's very important, raises the suspicion that it may be in the nature of the political realm to deny or pervert truth of every kind. Namely, that politics simply cannot involve truth. That's what she wants to th think about. In other words, when facts are unreliable, we lose faith in factual truth itself as a political idea. And thus, what is at stake, our insists, is not just one fact or another one. What is at stake is politics itself, the idea that we together as a people can come together and make a world for ourselves. OK. Is this an old problem? Hasn't it always been the case that people disagree about facts and that facts are turned into opinions? If one looks back in history, it is quickly apparent that dissensus is the norm and consensus the exception. Many who today bemoan the rise of Fox News and CNBC, along with the loss of the New York Times as a meaningful literary or journalistic endeavor, forget that for most of America's history, workers and elites, blacks and whites, northerners and southerners, read different newspapers and inhabited very different worlds. They often held very different and contradictory ideas of what America is and should be. From a historical perspective, it is actually the consensual politics of post-World War II America that is an exception, not its gradual breakdown in recent decades. But what Arendt thinks is different, and what I'm going to try and suggest to you is different and matters, is that what we have today is not just different facts and disagreements, but the mass manipulation of fact. Right? The example that she likes to cite of this is the Russian the Soviet attempt to erase uh, Trotsky from the history books. Some of you know this, but Trotsky was uh, one of the leaders of the Russian Revolution. He had a big falling out with Stalin, and Stalin basically cut, erased, rewrote, and erased him from all the history books, tried to make it so he didn't exist. Um, she calls such an attempt a totalitarian lie. And she says such manipulation is now possible. You can lie now in a way that revises all the records and creates new ones. You can destroy the evidence. On the internet and in the media, you can scrub people away. You can create false biographies. You can create false facts. You can, in a sense, unmake and make from scratch whole realities. When Arendt set out to write about totalitarianism in her first main book was called The Origins of Totalitarianism published in 1950. When she set out to write about totalitarianism and emerged in the 20th century, she opposed those who saw the Nazi and Bolshevik movements as forms of tyranny or fascism. She said that they were different. They're not just another tyranny, not just fascism. Instead, she argued that totalitarian government was something new and we needed to face up to its newness. Similarly, when Arendt focused her gaze on the American Revolution in a book called On Revolution, she insisted that the American Revolution was not like other revolutions, the French or the Russian, and we needed to see what its difference was. And similarly here with facts and lying. While historical perspective is important, and it's important to remember that we've always lied in politics. In fact, she says, it may be that lying is at the essence of politics, insofar as when you lie, you change reality, and that's what a politician wants to do to a certain extent to make things diff different, better. But it's equally important to be alert to the newness of the way we lie today, the new practices and societal forms of lying. The essence of the modern political lie for our end is, quote, that it addresses things that are not secrets at all, but are known to practically everybody, like torture, like that 9-11 was committed against the United States, not by the United States that global warming has happened. And yet, we don't believe these as facts. We treat them as opinions. We reduce them. How do we do this? Through what she calls thoughtlessness, the 
use of cliches, the rationale, the rationalization of obedience or, 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 or convention. And she says that in response, what we need is a kind of thinking that returns us to um, engage the world thoughtfully, that opposes this thoughtless acceptance of the reduction of facts to opinions. And she says it's very possible that we can do this in a certain way, because the kind of full rewriting of history that totalitarianism aims for is not easy. It may even be impossible. It can't be sustained, for sure. Um, Arendt, in a number of her books, talks about, and this is one of my favorite of her phrases, she says, the holes of oblivion do not exist. The holes of oblivion do not exist. Nothing human is perfect. There are simply too many people in the world for some group or person to pull off a complete defactualization of the world. Someone, somewhere, is going to have known that it's untrue and is gonna stand up and say something. As she says, one man will always be alive to tell a story. And when one does, that story is part of our world and can't be forgotten. But if the images created by media fabricators today are not um, are not totalizing, right? They don't. They're not going to be. We're not in a totalitarian moment. No one group has the monopoly on spin and images. They nevertheless have an important and corrosive effect upon our political culture. The image of America as a nation that doesn't torture, as a nation of human rights, prevails over the facts. It causes doubt. The image of America as a response, a doubt that we torture. The image of America as a responsible country prevails over the irresponsibility about doing nothing over global warming. And it causes doubt about whether we should. And the image that the government is covering something up about its own involvement in 9-11 causes doubt about whether we can trust the government to deal with these kind of crises. There's a kind of self-deception going on where we deceive ourselves about who we are and what we are. We now face a world of multiple images, multiple realities, fully built, fully built echo chambers of monomaniacal self-certainty. Those who watch Fox News on one side, those who watch CNBC on the other, the truthers on one side, the, the, the environmentalists on one side, the, 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 uh, the environmental deniers on the other. And these various worldviews, each hermetic, clash against one another whenever they are forced outside their internal world. The danger is not necessarily that one of these views will prevail. As soon as they gain a certain popularity, they usually re their, their internal logic breaks down and people begin to see them as, as a bit crazy. The danger is that the powerlessness of images to triumph is, does not, however, mean that they're innocuous. The danger is in the elevation of image over fact and the blurring of the line between fact and opinion, which leads our end rights to cynicism. And this, again, is the point that I want to drive home. The overall point that our end worries about in truth and politics is not simply that one version of the lie, the right version or the wrong version, will win. Rather, it is a danger that amidst the battle over facts, the very belief in the ability to say what is, to know the world, is put into question. Arendt's worry is that the war over images leads not to the victory of one image over another, but to the victory of cynicism, to the belief that it is simply not possible to speak the truth. And then the next point I want to make, because it's also a second central point of her essay, is that there is no remedy for such cynicism. It's a hard fact, and it's at the core of her argument. There is no remedy for the blurring of fact and opinion and the resulting cynicism, because at bottom facts are contingent and vulnerable. A teller, she says, a teller of factual truth in the unlikely event that he wished to stake his life on a particular fact, if I wish to say, global warming exists, and I'm going to stake my life on it, how could I do it? I could.
could sacrifice myself. I could burn myself in Times Square or on the mall in Washington. But as she says, this doesn't tell anything about the truthfulness of my point. For why should the liar stick to his lies with great courage, especially in politics, where he might be motivated by patriotism or some kind of legitimate group partiality? There's just no way to make the truth prevail. It's easy, she says, to discredit factual truths. Much of factual truth comes from eyewitness accounts, which are notoriously unreliable. For those of you who ever go to law school, you'll learn this very quickly. The most unreliable piece of evidence admitted in the law are eyewitness testimony. People don't remember what they think they remember. Documents can be forged. When a dispute emerges as to a witness or a document, there's no higher judge who can decide the matter. And thus, the settlement of factual disputes is a majority decision. Now, does that mean that she thinks there are no facts, as many philosophers, and I'm sure some of you believe? No, it doesn't. Arendt insists that there are facts. Of course, facts must be interpreted. They must be selected, picked out of chaos, and formed into a story. And yes, every generation has the right to write its own story. But that is not the same right as the right to touch the factual matter itself. And yet, the factual matter is in danger. That's her point. Here, and it's, for those of you who've read the essay, the opening footnote is important to consider. Arendt tells you in that opening footnote that the essay arises out of her own experience. Some of you know this, but her most famous book is a book called Eichmann in Jerusalem. Uh, about the trial of Adolf Eichmann. It was originally written as a, a, a series of essays for the New Yorker magazine. And it caused quite a controversy. Um, uh, although she doesn't think it caused the controversy because she thinks the controversy had nothing to do with her book. Um, and she says that it was her experience of this controversy that led her to write this essay. And she identifies two issues in that footnote. She says, first, it made me ask the question, is it always legitimate to tell the truth? I already told you what her answer is. She says yes. This comes up because she says some things in that book which everyone knows are true, but that a lot of people, including a lot of Jews of her generation, and she was a Jew, of course, she was a Holocaust survivor, um, thought shouldn't have been said. And she says, I think it is right to tell the truth. You should never be punished for telling the truth. And then the second issue that she says is that it caused her to reflect on the controversy about lies about what she had written and lies about facts she had reported. Now, lies about what she had written and lies about the facts that she reported. Basically what she says is that um, the controversy had nothing to do with the facts of what she said, uh, or of what happened. Um, she went to the trial of Adolf Eichmann and simply observed him and him. And one of the things she said is that he was like a, a pretty normal guy. He was banal. If there was anything distinctive about him, she said, it's that he just seemed unable to think, unable to think. He spoke in cliches. He spoke in, in, in stock phrases. Um, and so she said, what was amazing is that here was this guy who did this unspeakable evil, the worst act in the history of Western civilization, potentially. A huge part of it, or at least a big part of it. And he seemed pretty normal. And she said, there's a way in which evil is banal. And people went nuts. Why? Well, she thinks that people went nuts. Because if they were to accept her reasoning, they would see no reason why everyone else would do what Eichmann did. Right? Some of you have heard of the Milgram experiments, uh, where, we, where people are asked to apply shocks to, uh, to, to act people, it turns out, are actors, but they don't know this. And the researchers keep telling them to apply the shocks higher and higher, and the actors are like, buzzing around, looking like they're going to die. 
and the people keep applying the shocks when they're told to, and the researchers say, don't worry, don't worry, it's okay, just doing it, and the people keep applying the shocks. Well, the Milgram experiment gave a lot of uh, support to this view that people, most people, or many people, would do what Eichmann did if they were told to and if it was what everyone else was doing and they believed the authorities over them were good people. Arendt says, I never meant that and I never said that. All I said is, it's what Eichmann did. Everyone, and that she says is a fact. Everyone else assumed, I must mean that's what I think everyone would do. And she says, they probably assume that because that's what they would do. But that's not a fact. And to, and to say, Eichmann must have been a monster, she says, is to take a theory and insist that the facts meet the theory and not the other way around. And so what she says is that we need to think about something very hard that the controversy over her Eichmann book brought forth, which is the fact. And now we're talking about a fact that we live in a world without truth. That facts are ignored. That images replace facts. That spin replaces facts. That there's no way to establish facts today. That the image makers have won. And this brings us to the fifth part of the essay, which I know you were reading for, for, for language and thinking, where she says that what we need to do is take seriously the fact that today there are no truth tellers. There are no people today who can stand up and say, I'm gonna tell you the truth and be believed. Why are there no truth tellers today? Because everybody is seen as interested, as political. Well, who were the truth tellers? Well, they come from different areas of life. They come from arts, the novelists, they come from academics, the scientists. Uh, they come from sometimes historians, scholarship, people who are supposed to simply tell you what is in different ways, show you the world. And what she says is everybody has now been implicated in politics. And once everyone is implicated in politics, the solitude of, of the philosopher is disappears. Public institutions, like colleges or universities, public or private, but institutions for the public good, uh, become are no longer refuges of truth, refuges of truth, but are simply politicized environments. And this is largely what's happened. And what Arendt says is, if we're going, we, we can't really stop it, but what we need what we need to encourage, what we need to in some way incite, are a few people who are willing to pull back from politics and live apolitically. And we need this in order to save politics. She says, the political realm recognized that it needed an institution outside the power struggle in addition to the impartiality required in the administration of justice. Politics needs institutions outside the, the, the power struggle. And that's where the truth teller is going to take their stand. Where today is the truth teller going to come from? Well, the traditional answer has been colleges, universities. So what is a college education today? What are the liberal arts? One answer is, the college is a place where you escape from the world. The ivory tower. Another answer is, a college is a place where you come to engage in politics. You fight, you get politicized, you join groups, you, you get political battles, you join clubs, you act in college very much like you'd act in the world when you're fighting for political interests. Our end's view is neither, and both. To think what we are doing is what she says we need to learn, and what colleges can teach us. To engage with the world 
and yet do so from afar. She called herself in a letter she once wrote, a stranger from afar. She also called herself a conscious pariah. Someone who consciously chose to make herself a pariah, someone who doesn't fit in, who stands outside of society and of conventions, who separates oneself from the world in order to have the ability to look at it honestly and to see it for what it is and thus to be able to say what it is. And so, as you go through four years of Bard, recall at least one definition of what you should try and strive to attain here at a liberal arts education. To learn how to say the truth, the first step on that path, the first step on the path to the recognition of how to say the truth, is how incredibly difficult it is. So thank you very much. I don't know how much time do I have. Are there any questions? Yes, back. Just stand here. The mic. The mic. Um, can you can you up that? Yeah. Um, with all the, with all these revolutions and government overthrows going on in places around the world, which are to some considered uh, victories for government for government visibility and free expression, free speech, how do you think this could conflict with the restraints that on our I understand it is about the revolutions in the Middle East and, and maybe elsewhere as well, uh, where it seems like uh, there's a certain kind of transparency. Is that the claim? Yes. Um, or at least an, an increase in transparency. An increase in transparency. Uh, and thus um, would seem to lead to, I guess, the thesis of the question is more truth. Is that is that fair? S sort of. But at, at, at the same time, like, the people who are, spread, who are spreading opinions in the place of fact are touting themselves as supporters of free speech and government transparency and so on. So how do you think those two can play or coincide? Okay. Um, good question. Great question. Um, you know, uh, Wahil Gonim, who was the Google uh, executive in Egypt, who has become one of the many faces of the, of the Egyptian um, uh, revolution, um, as well as the man whose name I don't know, I don't know if anyone knows it, you can tell me, who burned himself in the square in, in, uh, uh, in the... Tunisia. Both of these people are, are people that... Um, Hannah Arendt would recognize as political actors. Um, they're people whose actions, spontaneous, unexpected, radically new, entered the public sphere and changed it forever. That is, in a sense, the highest praise that Arendt would, would bestow on somebody. Um, and to be a political actor means both to act, but also to have your act spoken about and talked about and reacted to in the public sphere. Both these people had that happen. Um, whether a revolution will make good on that promise of politics uh, is always an open question. So um, uh, most revolutions, of course, fail. Um, I don't want to be a complete pessimist, uh, but it doesn't look good right now if you follow the news in the Middle East. Um, certainly uh, in, in Libya, you have, um, uh, well, let's just call it a fiasco. Uh, and in Egypt, uh, you have um, what many people see as the 
uh, military and the religious uh, Muslim Brotherhood um, forcing the quote unquote liberals and democracy advocates um, out of all leadership and, 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 and governance of, of the country and of the revolution. Um, in order for a revolution to succeed, Han Arendt writes, and she wrote a book on this called On Revolution, um, it needs to create different power structures that will oppose one another and each have their own power base uh, institutionally um, so that um, no one section, no one institution can take over completely. Uh, and, the and the revolution that she says did this the best was the American Revolution. Um, you know, uh, uh, I, I have I have great hopes, and yet they're not. I, I fear I have more fears. I think that the revolutions in the Middle East will will probably lead to new sorts of um, uh, new sorts of governments we can't yet predict yet that have very little to do with the kind of ideals of democracy and free speech that, that many of you hope will will emerge there. Um, but one can hope. is about WikiLeaks. Um, you know, I think that's an excellent question. And um, let me say that the what WikiLeaks stands for, above everything else, is the claim that transparency is good. Right? Um, if we just have transparency, life will be better. We'll all know what's going on. Um, that's not always right. Now you guys are a little young for this, but you lived in, you haven't been married. I don't think. But you've probably lived with parents. Do you want to know everything? Do you want them to know everything? Um, what WikiLeaks stands for is that if we all know everything, we'll all trust each other. I find that unlikely. Um, life depends upon uh, deception, concealing, uh, mystery. I mean, how would you love someone without them being a bit of a mystery? Um, and the problem that the age of WikiLeaks offers is that our entire lives will be made transparent, um, public and private. Uh, it's not clear that diplomacy could work. And this was this was of course the United States arguments against WikiLeaks, right? How can you have meaningful diplomacy with your in the world if you if people know what you actually think? No one will trust anybody. This was another one of those instances in which 
The secrets were things that were in plain sight. And for the Pentagon Papers, it's much the same. And so um, what I'd say is having them published in WikiLeaks doesn't actually reveal, for the most part, new facts. What it does is, is it takes away the innuendo and the mystery and the deniability and the ability to say, well, you know, we're fudging this. That is essential for all relationships and all diplomacy. Um, yes, you want to you follow up? case, right? There aren't many facts that I that I know of that WikiLeaks revealed that weren't known um, to people. Uh, and there are certainly, as far as I can tell, nothing changed in the world post WikiLeaks. It's not like suddenly everybody now knows that Pakistan's uh, a country that has some Islamic elements in top places in it and that we're worried about that. We knew that. All that we have now is we have our diplomats on record telling other diplomats, these people that we're trying to work with, we hate and we have no respect for. Possibly, uh, you know, I, I think well, I think people did know it, and I don't think people know it more now than they did then. Let me put it that way. If people want to ignore it then, they'll ignore it now as well. All the way in the back. Uncertainty, and that this feeds this need to believe in something. Um, Arendt would go a bit further and say that it's a kind of metaphysical fear. Um, she talks about our age as the age of homelessness and rootlessness. Um, I mean, this is to go a bit afield, uh, but but I think it's it's important because the point is that for most of history, we have lived, you know in small groups, families, and communities, and we've known who we are, right? Poles, or Jews, or Americans, or, or English, or, or Anglo-Saxons, or Greeks, or Islam, or Muslims, etc. And um, largely we had a sense of rootedness and, and belonging in the world, and it gave us a certain purpose. Um, our end is part of a philosophical school that has its roots in someone named Martin Heidegger, and others, Nietzsche, as Friedrich Nietzsche as well, that thinks we've entered an age in which um, we don't have any set purposes. Nietzsche calls it the Schwergewicht, the, 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 the heavy weight that gives meaning to our world is lost. And um, that creates a deep need and uncertainty and fear for why we're here and what we're doing. And she says that that, that leads to a desire for belonging belong to some group, to believe in something. And thus we are, we have an incredible propensity today to adopt and adapt um, ideologies and believe them. And even when the facts, even when WikiLeaks is published and shows us that our facts are wrong, we still believe them. That's her point. I guess, I guess this is what I guess when I want to say the WikiLeaks question as well. Our end's point is you can publish every fact you want people aren't going to believe them. Because if people need to believe in their world, and their ideology, and their way of thinking, 
it's not going to matter what facts are out there. And the more fear there is, the less, the more they're going to cling to their created worlds. Whether it's a metaphysical fear, or whether it's the fear of pensions, or whether it's the fear of terrorism. So I think that's exactly right. Um, we'll go over to this side. Can you stand up, please? I'm having a hard Thomas mentioned it in the earlier part, why we must judge, is about that, the one I wrote, and, and certainly Arendt has written a lot on this question. Um, in the, uh, I think it's in Truth and Politics, the essay you're reading, but not in the parts you're reading, so if you go and look for it. She talks about um, uh, her belief at one point um, in the Socratic maxim that it's better to suffer wrong than do wrong. You understand? So it's, if you have a choice of suffering um, and being wronged, or doing wrong and not suffering, she says, what Socrates taught is the moral maxim that it's right to suffer rather than do. She says, that is probably the only moral fact in Western civilization. And she says the only reason it became a moral fact, that it got established as a fact, is the force of Socrates' personality and his example, and how it's been sort of the leading example of what a moral person has been for 2,000 some odd years. Um, and she says that in Western society, we've taken that as a fact of morality. But she also says that in the last hundred years, that fact has disappeared. That people have given up and now question that Socratic fact of that it is better to suffer wrong than to wrong. She says, if they question that, if people will actually say, well, you know, it's actually sometimes better to, to, to not suffer, right? A utilitarian argument or something. If people are going to question that, which is, is, in her mind, is the only basic moral fact. There's nothing left. And so to her, that's a fact, but she would admit that today it's no longer viable. institutions as truth tellers. Well, first of all, let me say she doesn't think that's the case today. Um, I mean, she, in, the, in the essay, what she says is that's what they should be, and that's what they emerged as, as places outside of politics. But I think it's very hard for anybody to look at academic institutions today and see them as depoliticized. Um, this is, uh, to a large extent, although not exclusively, uh, carryover from the revolutionary changes that our universities in this country and around the Western world at least went through in the 1960s when students you know, occupied buildings in Columbia and Berkeley and Harvard and other places and insisted that politics be brought front and center uh, into the academy. Um, those students are now the tenured faculty around the country um, and most of them are from the left, which is why most people on the right in this country, even many who went to universities, don't put much faith in or stock in the truth-telling capacities of, or at least many people, uh, I don't want to say most, um, uh, of the universities. Which is why it's important for universities, if you want them to be places where 
truth telling happens and can be uh, nurtured, we have to strive to depoliticize the universe. That doesn't mean we disengage from public questions. That's what I'm trying to say. It means that we understand that to engage in public questions, we can do so on a question of intellectual integrity and truth rather than politics. But it's a very hard thing to do. And one of the things you'll have to judge as you go through four years of college is how often your teachers and your professors uh, rise above politics and teach you something true, whatever political position it comes from. And how often you're going to accept that or you're going to say, but what are the politics behind that? What are the assumptions behind that? Isn't that just you know, some kind of political presupposition? Because that's often the way students in this age react. They want to know what are the political implications of things. And that's not wrong to want to know that. It's our job, I think, at our best to rise, raise you above it. Yeah, on the end there. Go together, but uh, the answer is that 
it gets established as a fact. And once it does, if it's a fact, it's something that shouldn't be and can't, shouldn't be touched, which doesn't mean it can't be. All facts can be defactualized. Yeah, uh, a, a tr between truth and fact. Um, okay, she, if you read the essay, she talks about different kinds of truths, and there are different kinds of truths. Um, she talks about rational truth, and philosophical truth, and factual truth. I've been trying to speak only about factual truth, um, just to simplify things. If you want to get more complicated and go into the essay, you can read the, the, the long distinction she draws between factual and rational truth. Two more. Anyone have a, a real question you want to ask? Okay. No, I don't. I think mean, great. I just they're like, not, no. I just had an excited question, not not like a, the others have not been. Yeah. Good. At least you know it. Science has done is delegitimized 
all the other discourses of truth. And it itself now has been delegitimized, which leads us to a world in which we don't believe in any truth, which Nietzsche calls nihilism. Right? Um, that's my argument. Your argument. 